Before we start today's show, I'll tell you the podcast brought to you every single day by the Oxford Exxon Highway 6 West in Oxford. Go ahead and get a lunch special. I believe it's red beans and rice today. Two sides of bread, 32-ounce drink for four ninety nine. Get some ribs or much more there with the Oxford Exxon. If you're coming into the game tonight, Ole Miss and LSU, take advantage right there on Highway 6 West. Great gas prices, clean convenience store, and much more. And maybe you're coming in in a Clark Ford. Clark Ford is in Amory, Mississippi, 662-257-1900, Highway 25 in Amory. Give Corey a call. You get a quote within 15 minutes and business hours. Shopping around, take it. It's going to be the best deal. So when you're signing that paperwork at the end, mention the podcast. This podcast, any of the MPW digital family of podcasts, an extra $500 off there with Clark Ford. Now onto the show. From the Clark Ford studio in Oxford, Mississippi, MPW Digital proudly presents the Oxford Exxon podcast. I'd say thanks for tuning in. But why am I going to give you a round of applause for something you're supposed to do, to be frank? And now, here are your hosts, Chase Parm. And broadcast school has really paid off. And Neil McCready. I deserve to be on TV. Welcome to this Tuesday edition of the Oxford Exxon Podcast. Chase Parm, Neil McCready, Clark Ford Studio this morning, Matt Moscona. Baton Rouge radio personality going to uh, join us to talk a lot of LSU. Obviously, the Tigers basketball team in Oxford tonight, an 8 p.m. tip for that one between two undefeated SEC programs. We're going to talk some football with Ed Orgeron's group and then uh, some baseball as well, including one thing that probably ends up a uh, message board topic at some point. So that on to uh, today's show as we uh, get started today again, 8 o'clock nil tonight, some preview stuff uh up notes and whatnot at rebelgrove.com it's the the three and oh rebels the two and oh uh tigers and probably the uh the best front court Ole Miss has seen to this point will be in uh in Oxford tonight yeah this is a really talented team that LSU has they've got really kind of everything you want in college basketball an elite point guard uh, other guys in the front in the backcourt that can shoot it they're very athletic um there's there's really uh, there's really no weakness. They've got bigs who can hit the glass. They've got bigs who can stretch the floor and hit the three. Uh, Will Wade's a good coach. He's a better recruiter than he is a coach, but he's a good coach. It's a really talented team. They uh, haven't lost many games. They've lost three games. Um, only one of those losses is a questionable loss. They lost to a really good Houston team. Um, they lost to Oklahoma State, which was a bad loss. They lost to Florida State, which was a neutral floor loss early in the year. They're good. Um, they had a lot of adversity early in the season, obviously, with uh, with the, the the murder of one of their players. But um, this is going to be a real test. We've talked uh, on this show a number of times about how I thought Ole Miss would go to Mississippi State and potentially win, and then this would be kind of a letdown. I'm kind of on guard for that tonight. But a loss tonight would not necessarily mean a letdown. A loss tonight could just mean you got beat by a a, a, a team that is absolutely loaded with talent. Yeah, that's where I was going to go with this is, look, tonight is going to be – it's going to be a big environment. It's going to be a big crowd, especially for a, an 8 p.m. start where the students still are not back in town. But it's going to be full – um, had a lot of people talking about tickets the last couple of days. I mean, I, I'm going just to kind of check it out, and I don't do that for basketball very often, but I'm kind of curious to see them in person. Um, it's not a freak-out moment if they lose a game to LSU tonight. I, I think that's the main caution word for today's podcast is, dude, they're, they're playing a team that's projected to be in the NCAA tournament, playing a team that has tons of talent, as you'll hear even more about as we move on with today's show, and playing a team that Ken Palm projects to go 11-7 and seven in the league. So I think that's the biggest thing is just some caution. I'd kind of take this week as a whole, and even even at 1-1, one and one, the, 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 the week is fine. You're 4-1 and one and sure. you move on. If you get to 5-0, and oh, that's just cake and, and even more whatever. But at the end of the day, yeah, I, I don't – I, I, I don't want to see or deal with a bunch of we are Ole Miss stuff because you lose a game to LSU tonight in Oxford. Well, this is where I, I got a little uh, – I'm, I'm not going to get into all the inside baseball stuff, but I said yesterday that, you know, the AP ranking's not a big deal. Of course, that was twisted to me downplaying it. I'm not downplaying it. Um, I'm not saying it's not a, a, not a, a big thing. It's not an accomplishment for a program. It absolutely is. It's uh, it's it's a great recruiting tool. 
for Kermit Davis and his staff. But maintaining your AP ranking week after week is not an important thing based on what you're trying to do with your program, which is, in their words, not mine, get to the NCAA tournament. A one-in-one week this week is perfectly fine. If you're four-in-one in the league going to Alabama next Tuesday, you're perfectly fine. You don't want to lose both games this week. Winning both games changes the trajectory of your season yet again, but if you're one and one this week and you're four and one going to Alabama, you're in great shape for accomplishing the goal that you stated for your season, which is to get to the NCAA tournament because you would be four and one with 13 games left. You would need to win seven of the next 13. Yeah, it's very doable. It's very doable. If you win five, if you're five and zero, oh, well, now you start talking about a completely different type of season that you could be on the precipice of. But it's just amazing how little things that that you say that you don't think anything of get twisted and turned into you being negative and out to get a program. It's we're talking about a very small. I mean, let's not make that. Well, more than but I'm is, talking so. to a very specific three or four people at this moment that that are, I promise you, listening. It's, just, um, it's it's idiotic. I know. I just don't act like fans are doing something. No, it's not fans. It's 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 other people. It's just a weird. It's a weird subset of of of, of people. But a loss tonight does not necessarily mean that you had a letdown. A loss tonight could mean that you just couldn't handle Waters. He's one of those players, one of a handful of players in in the SEC who have the ability to absolutely take over a game. Ole Miss has one of those too. And Terrence Davis. Congratulations to TD, by the way, the SEC Player of the Week after uh, after a great week that he had against Auburn and, and, and Mississippi State. Um, TD can take over a game. LSU, I can assure you, is worried about Ole Miss's backcourt. Um, Ole Miss is worried about LSU's. It ought to be a great environment. It ought to be a lot of fun. Uh, these are two teams that right now today look like tournament teams, play like tournament teams. LSU uh, not quite as uh, chemically balanced that it, it, as as they probably will be at the end of the year. Frankly, for Ole Miss, this is kind of a, a schedule break. Catching them early as opposed to catching them late. I have a suspicion LSU uh, is going to be one of those teams that gets better as the season goes on. I think Ole Miss is one of those teams. As this Ole Miss team, assuming it stays healthy, as this Ole Miss team builds confidence, and gets more and more confident in what they're trying to do defensively, which is the next big step for this team, they get really dangerous. Because offensively, here's what's interesting last week. There's so much talk about a defensive stop here and a defensive stop there. They scored in the 80s twice, right? Auburn and Mississippi State? Yeah, 82 and 81. I mean, they're winning games with offense right now. They're de- 84, anyway, yeah. yeah. Their defense, as their defense comes along, and it's making strides if you're watching them game after game. As their defense comes along, this team just gets more and more dangerous because the offense has been uh, very efficient. Bruce Pearl was on the uh, SEC coaches teleconference yesterday. Uh, was asked a couple of questions about Ole Miss and, and sort of repeated the same thing that he had said after uh, his team lost to Ole Miss and Oxford on Wednesday. And that's that when he went back and looked at their film from that game, Ole Miss was just very efficient offensively. Not many wasted trips. Not many bad shots. I mean, you're going to have wasted trips, and you're going to have bad shots. That's that's going to happen in uh, in college ba- in any basketball. But Ole Miss has cut that out for the most part. It's the biggest change in their uh, in their team from year to year. And you know, Kermit's talked about this. It's the part that we haven't talked about much. These kids, Terrence Davis, uh, Devontae Schuler. Um, Brian Tyree, Dominic Olenichik, Bruce Stevens. Those guys went through, what they lose, seven in a row, 10 out of 11 at one point last year. They've, they've been on the bottom end of this. They know what it feels like. It was not a good feeling. They, they knew they were better than they were a year ago. Um, the season went sideways. They give them a lot of credit for just sort of some fortitude to say, I'm not, I'm not going there again. Brian talked about that before the season. Just I'm not, I'm not going there again, and so um, it's just a lot, a lot happening. It ought to be a really fun environment tonight. But a 
a four point LSU win does not necess- does not mean that everybody should come back with the well they weren't ready, they weren't focused, they had a letdown. They the ranking got to their head. No, it just means you ran into a really talented team. Looking at the rest of the schedule for today and tomorrow, tonight, Kentucky is at Georgia at 7 o'clock, whatever. Um, big one here, though, in Starkville tonight at 7 o'clock, the Florida Gators are in town to play the Bulldogs. Yeah, it's a huge game for uh, for both teams. Mike Technically White, 6 o'clock, sorry, I'm looking at Eastern Time. So Mike White needs a win. And State's got to have one. State's got to win. That's a must-win game early in the year. Arkansas is at Tennessee tonight. The Volunteers are going to take care of that one. Yeah. And then tomorrow you've got Alabama at Mizzou, Auburn at A&M, and then a game where you need to be cheering here a little bit if you're an Ole Miss fan. At 6 o'clock, the South Carolina Gamecocks are at the Vanderbilt Commodores. Vanderbilt's got to have that one, or that whole win falls off the map right now. Yeah, you need Vanderbilt to win tomorrow. I've, it's it's the weird That would be a brutally ugly loss. It's the weird thing for Ole Miss. You want to make sure that Mississippi State doesn't crater. You you need Mississippi you want State the Bulldogs to, to beat Florida tonight. You need Mississippi State to stay in that top seventy five. You don't need them to fall off the map as much as you might enjoy that at the uh, at the water cooler. You need your your quadrant one wins to stay quadrant one wins. And you need to be cheering for San Diego. You need to be cheering for Baylor. Um. Those kind of games you need to be cheering for those teams. Baylor currently at 80 in the uh, in the net. That is a quadrant two game at the moment. San Diego's falling all the way down to 122 um, yeah. at the moment. Good news uh, is it's a win. Where are there two losses? Uh, you also need to be cheering for Butler and Cincinnati. You need them to do big things. They're both quadrant one losses. Uh, Cincinnati's at 35, and Butler is at 48 as of this morning. Yeah, so they're they're in great shape. If the tournament were seeded today, they're a four or a five. Literally a four or five. Somewhere in there. Probably a five. Unbelievable. I would have never, never in a million years guessed it. No, it's been fascinating. I mean, that's that's the thing. It, 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 it feels like this really, really, really like violent upburst when you need the fans to just kind of chill out and just be basketball fans for a season. You know what I mean? Like it, it feels like one loss and the air pops, and that shouldn't be the case. It should just well, be a they're, continuation. They're not going continuation. undefeated in the league. No. Going to lose going to lose some league games. Yeah, that would be a story. Um 18 and 0 would be a pretty big would be a story. Big story. That would probably mean a one seed. You think? Yeah, 18 and 0. What are they now? They're 13 and 2. Yeah. That would be uh, 15 more wins. So, Six, And then you got Iowa State, too, lingering out 28 there. 28-2. and two. We'll just give them the Iowa State game for the sheer hell of it. It's 29-2. and two. You'd be in Nashville on a Friday trying to get your 30th win of the season, and, yeah, you'd be a one seed. You could lose that one even. It'd be all right. Duke lost last night. Did they? Yeah, Jim Beheim in Syracuse. Oh, went, I did see that. Yeah. Went into, uh, into Duke and won. I saw that. No one's great. They should be great. They have the talent to be great. They're not great. They have cohesive problems, kind of like Kentucky has at times. Yeah, it's eight, three 18-year-old kids who are going to be high lottery picks who are trying to make sure they preserve their status as high lottery picks. You don't think there's some distractions around those guys, do you? R.J. Barrett, Zion Williamson. It's the problem. In some ways, you got to give Cal credit that he actually puts it together more often than not because that can be a chemistry nightmare to have that. I mean, it's a first-world problem now, but Cal's nonetheless. A, Cal's a really good coach. He, he He's great at handling personalities. That is his absolute yeah. best quality. Frankly, it's a little surprising that he wouldn't have more NBA success given that. But. He probably would have NBA success. He's got a good gig. Amazing how much Kentucky fans are real testy about Cal right now. Testy about him. Just having the debate if he's underachieved. He only has one title since he's been there. Winning a title is hard. It is. Not. Yeah. It's a tournament where if you have one bad half, you can lose. Yeah. One shot. 
You uh, chimed in on this yesterday. The internet a buzz is uh, Clemson goes to the White House and gets fast food yesterday. Um, oh, I've never seen more sports writers make asses of themselves. In what way? I didn't. I wasn't on the internet a lot yesterday. Well, me look, most media leans far to the left, far, far, far to the left. A lot of media is ba- basically socialist. I mean, there are people that don't make money, they don't understand money, they don't like money. They're very jealous of people who do make money. They're ideologues. Okay, look. When you go to the White House to be honored as a national champion, are you really worried about what you're going to eat? So they're upset that that was the menu was the problem yesterday. I didn't see anyone from Clemson upset. No, 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 just in general. The media was upset that it was... There's a shutdown, as we know. Um, and again, I'm not a Trump guy. What is the typical menu for these occasions? I have no idea, which is sort of my point. Yeah. When the Cubs went to the, the White House to be honored as World Series champs in Barack Obama's final days in office, mm-hmm. I don't remember anyone ever saying anything about what they did or did not eat at the White House. So they... The president put a big spread of it was McDonald's, Wendy's, McDonald's, Burger King, and appeared to be some salads or something. Something. I saw pictures. And people talked. To, people just went nuts on the internet. And my thing was, I've never seen so many sports writers obsessed about the health quality of food in my life. These are the same dudes, many of whom tweeted about this yesterday, who walk around press boxes 70 pounds overweight, wearing clothes from the 70s, looking as slovenly as possible, just strapping on the feed bag. As fr- I mean, literally, man, halftime comes and it, some hot dogs are back in the back. Boom, racing to get the hot dogs. And you're worried about whether a player from Clemson might have a whopper? It'd be all right. I forget what school it was. It's one of my favorite stories. Whatever press box in the Big Ten that had the McFlurry machine, that like with five minutes left in the first half, all the media would get up and go line up for the McFlurry it machine. It was Purdue, wasn't it? I don't remember. Yeah, I don't recall which 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 one it was. But I mean, just just stop. Just Say, say, hey, I don't like this president, and I'm looking for something, and okay. I, I, I'm, I'm fine with that. But don't, don't. Could have thrown some chicken sandwiches in there. Could have, could have grabbed some Chick-fil-A. I'm just saying. Clemson, Clemson kids probably would have been appreciative of the Chick-fil-A. Yeah, and they could have thrown some of the grilled Chick-fil-A in there, and that would have. Uh... But again, when you go to the White House, are you really thinking about what you're going to eat? Or are you thinking about, hey, I'm in the White House. We won the national championship, and I'm in the White House being honored as a national champion. Are you really thinking about what you're going to eat? They got restaurants in D.C., lots of them. You can leave the White House and go get a bite to eat. And and I bet you if the Clemson bus wanted to stop at a uh, Chick-fil-A or if they wanted to have some catered food, and they probably did, on the plane for the trip home, I'm guessing it's going to be okay. I just thought it was one of the biggest overreactions. It's going to be the one sandwich limit like happened at Ole Miss and Fresno a few years ago. <laughs> I, from the looks of it, man, they were they – were, They could have as much as they'd like. They could have as much as they like. and 300 burgers, I think I well, saw. Well, I saw the before and after photo. They were pretty wiped yeah, out. They were pretty, pretty much gone. Still some left, though? I, I couldn't quite tell. It looked like there okay. might have been a sandwich or two left. A filet of fish was available okay. if you wanted one. Just don't think. And then I loved how someone said, well, Clemson has a program where the guy is in charge of keeping them away from fast food. Yeah, I'm going to guess, I'm just a stab, that on January the 14th, having that one Whopper is not impacting your overall um, ability to repeat as champs next year. you got to get 1% better every day now. 1% better every day. Did that get them better? Did it get them better? It motivated them probably to get back to the White House because being honored as a national champion at the White House, I'm guessing, as someone who's never had that occur to him, I'm guessing that that's cool. 
read a few paragraphs here from an uh, ESPN story since you're a uh, lifelong Bears fan to get your reaction here. Okay. Uh, Bears kicker Cody Parkey's days in Chicago may be numbered. Head coach Matt Nagy uh, expressed disapproval on Monday with Parkey's decision to appear as a guest on a network morning show a mere five days after he missed a potentially game-winning 43-yard field goal attempt in the 16-15 loss to the Eagles. Quote, for me, you understand that we always talk about a we and not a me thing, he said at a season-ending news conference. We always talk about it as a team. We win as a team, lose as a team. You know, I just I didn't necessarily think that was too much of a we thing. Again, I didn't think it was a we thing. Again, he has 3.5 guaranteed, but it looks like they are uh, potentially pushing him on the way out. Yeah, he went on the Today Show. Turned it into a kind of a pity thing. Talked about how he was relieved a little bit that the kick was blocked. I don't know. Just when in doubt, shut up. Keep it simple. Yeah. His best strategy would have been, all I can do is move forward and work and go have the best off season of his life, whatever that entails for a kicker. Yeah, Chicago would be on the hook for four point four three seven million of of dead salary cap if it cuts Parky, which is a lot for a kicker. It's a lot. Yeah, I don't know what they'll do. They've had a hard time replacing Robbie Gold, who still kicks. Yeah, since the Bears got rid of Gold, I think he's seventy nine of eighty three <laughs> kicking. <laughs> Just I, a weekly reminder of your idiocy, the idiocy there, isn't it? Like, I don't know what the math on that is. Uh, yeah, but as is it as windy as it is in Chicago, though? Well, I mean, no, come it's, on. it's not. I mean, there there are some differences. I'm messing. I'm gonna see what the math on that is. It's extremely. It's very high. good. Let's see. But I'm 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 actually curious as to the specific math. Well, I mean, I had like a two second thought of cutting Will Lutz sometime on Saturday afternoon. So it was it's ninety five point one eight percent accurate for Robbie Gold. That's good. That's pretty good. That's that's good at the kicking the ball through the uprights thing. Ninety five point one eight percent. So he hit more posts this season than Gold has missed kicks out of his last 81. Well, yeah, and then some. Yeah. Not even counting the double hit since he got that last week, too. The double doink. Yes. Podcast brought to you in part by Community Mortgage, Oxford, Memphis, Soto County, and Chattanooga. One of the oldest mortgage companies in the southeast. All underwriting and processing is in Memphis. You're getting local underwriting and understands your market, a leader in condo financing, and the float down option. So lock in the current rate. But if I guess before you close, you get the lower rate. You can find Jason at 662-234-2704 or JLO, J-L-O-W-E, at communitymtg.com. The uh, podcast is also brought to you by Patterson and Earhart. Uh, Matt Moscona will join us in a little bit on the Patterson and Earhart hotline. Patterson and Earhart, attorneys at law, specialize in personal injury law and real estate law. But theirs is a general practice that can handle any of your legal needs when you contact Patterson and Earhart. You speak to one of the partners in the firm, and so handle your case, not some paralegal at a faceless corporate firm. If Patterson and Earhart can't help you, they'll refer you to someone who can. John Calvin Patterson and Wes Earhart are Ole Miss guys. They're local guys, and when you call them, you're going to get one of them on the phone within the same day, guaranteed. So whether you've been injured in a car wreck or have other legal issues, give them a call, 662-526-1992, or check out their website, Laws. Dot com. Your initial consultation is free. We've been telling you about the Home 2 Suites Oxford. You need to be on the lookout at the end of the month. They're going to be opening their football reservations for the 20, what, what year is it? 2019 uh, football season. Um, so be, uh, be on the lookout for that. Follow them on Instagram. Follow them on Twitter, Facebook, whatnot. Uh, and don't forget, uh, if you're coming in for Rebel Hoops or you're starting to think about your plans for the uh, Ole Miss baseball season, they're an ideal location for those coming to cheer uh, on the Rebel baseball, softball, basketball teams in Oxford. They're just a mile uh, off campus, off the old Taylor Road exit. Home to Suites, Oxford. Step into the uh, new year in style with Dead Soxy. You really need to experience the difference a quality sock makes. It's the, final, it's the first step, I should say, in dressing for the job you want and not the job you have. Go to deadsoxy.com. Enter the code Rebel Grove at checkout to receive 25% off all orders, including sale items. So uh, promo code Rebel Grove at checkout for 25% off all orders from deadsoxy.com.
Podcast is brought to you by GM Pharmacy. Don't waste your time with the big chains. Go somewhere you're appreciated. GM is locally owned and operated, and they care about their customers. One of Oxford's hometown trusted pharmacies for over 40 years and offer many great services such as MedSync, immunizations, and free delivery to your home or workplace right there on South Lamar Boulevard. Transferring your medications is simple. Just give them a call at 662-236-2222, and they will take care of the rest. Let's jump on the Patterson and Earhart hotline now and talk to Matt Moscona, all things LSU. Matt, enjoy uh, talking to you as always. Kick it off this morning with uh, basketball. We don't typically do that, but the uh, surprising Rebels 3-0 and in the SEC hosting LSU, also unbeaten. I don't know that we had this one circled, but it's uh, it's turned into a pretty big uh, early SEC slate game here tonight in Oxford. Even, guys, even just in the last week, I mean, I, I, I know Ole Miss is a four-point favorite tonight. A week ago, LSU probably would have been picked as a, a betting favorite in this game. I mean, Ole Miss had, had had the nice record, but you know Kermit kind of did what a lot of first year coaches do. You kind of stack your schedule with a bunch of winnable games early uh, to, to pile up some wins. I mean, um, they had the loss at Butler, but you know aside from that, a lot of uh, a lot of really winnable games to make the record look nice. And Johnny Jones did that in his last year at LSU, but. Um, what Ole Miss has done in the last week has gotten everybody's attention nationally. I mean, they're justified to be ranked, and I mean, to to beat Auburn, who I think is totally legit, and then to beat Mississippi State on the road Saturday, and I watched a good bit of that game. Um, I think State's a tournament team, also. I I think Ole Miss has everybody's attention, and they are stunningly efficient on offense. I mean, I'm not going to break down the whole Ole Miss team. I think y'all can do that better than I can. But just from an outsider's perspective. The offensive efficiency in year one, not even you know, just starting conference play in year one under Kermit Davis is super impressive, man. I mean, this this is definitely the biggest surprise in the SEC, and I dare I say one of the biggest surprises in the country is what Ole Miss has been able to do so far. Yeah, Ole Miss people are really geeked up as they should be about the the three and zero start, especially the two wins you referenced, Auburn and, and State. I, I watched both of those games in person, and both of those teams are tournament teams. This LSU team's a tournament team too. Um, I know they they needed overtime to win at Arkansas, which surprised me a little bit because I, I have so much respect for LSU's talent. But you've seen this team a bunch. Just how good is it? So they're definitely not the team a year ago for everybody who's who's not seen LSU yet uh last year when Will Wade's first year he just kind of cobbled together a roster of grad transfer juco freshman signee I mean he turned over I believe it was eight or nine spots on the roster last year just completely remade it and just tried to get through year one uh this team it kind of feels like one of those Kentucky teams that loses a bunch and then signs a bunch of five stars and they try to figure out how to play together. That's where LSU is. I mean, if Tremont Waters back is back and he's you know preseason All SEC and he's a, he's fantastic as everybody knew from a year ago. But what they've supplemented with is a super crop of talent that was a consensus top five recruiting class, where you've got Nas Reed who's. 6'10", 250, you will not be able to miss him. He is an Adonis on the court, and he's, he's trouble in the, in the paint, and he can step back and hit the three as well. He was four for four from three against Arkansas on Saturday. Um, they got a, a five-star guard named Javante Smart. He can shoot the three. He'll run the point sometime uh, for Tremont. Um, Emmett Williams is a 6'7", five-star, who is super athletic. He wears short shorts, so you will not be able to miss him if you haven't seen him yet. He rolls his shorts to where it's above the thigh. I mean, it's straight throwback city with the shorts. Uh, They signed a Juco kid named Marlon Taylor, who isn't incredibly efficient offensively, but he jumps out the gym. Like, he will have a highlight real dunk or play like that tonight that just he's good for it every game. Um, They're athletic. They're long. They can shoot. They can they can throw in the paint and score. They got an Oregon transfer named Cavell Bigby Williams, who is on their Final Four team. He's six eleven. He's a great shot blocker. Um, they've got everything. I mean, if you're building a team, they've got length, they've got size, they've got uh, the ability to shoot. Uh, they've just they're a super talented team. It's really just a matter of them learning their roles and figuring out how to play together this year. Yeah, I thought it was interesting yesterday on the uh, SEC coaches teleconference. Kermit Davis talked about LSU 
having more NBA prospects than probably any team in the league. And obviously that includes yeah. Kentucky, which has a lot of NBA prospects. I mean, you just named a bunch of guys that are probably going to play in in, uh, in the NBA. What's the – I know it's still early and he's kind of putting them together. And from what I've seen, they don't have just a ton of chemistry yet. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, so that's been the tough part for sure. Like uh, I mentioned Nas Reed, for example. The, you know, the, the, the big forward is 6'10", 250. Nas – his whole life has played facing the basket. Like he, and he, he started the season trying to play more of a wing and that's great. And I don't know that he's going to be that at the next level, because I don't think he can beat a guy. Like he can't face the basket and beat a good college defender off the dribble and get to the rim. That's just, that's, he's not going to shake somebody. Uh, they're too good at this level. He could do that in high school. So the transition for Nas has been, putting him on the block and playing with his back to the basket and trying to bang with some guys that are physically more you know, close to his size. And he'll make some beautiful plays, you know, where he'll head fake, go up and under. He got a dunk to start the game against Arkansas the other night, which is a beautiful play to the basket. Uh, and I mentioned he was four for, four for three, so he can stretch a defense too. But it's like, it's just it's that transition. You know, it's like it's him learning – how to play at this level against defenders that are his, you know, that are his size and match up with him physically. But it's not just Nas; it's everybody. Tremont Waters started this season, and you know he was so great last year. And he started this season really trying to. A year ago, LSU needed Tremont Waters to be everything. They needed him to be <laughs> haircut, buddy. Yes, we got a haircut. That's true. Sorry, he he got a haircut yesterday, and he's pretty fired up about it. Um, you know, I would be ago, so they, fired up if I could have gotten a haircut yesterday, so I completely understand. <laughs> Me too, bro. <laughs> um, well, you, and I, you and I have that similar characteristic. Um, but Tremont Waters needed to be everything for this team a year ago. Like, they needed him to score. They needed him to take over games. They needed him to distribute. They don't need him to do all of that this year. They've got so many other options. So they need him to play within himself. But it's been a struggle for Tremont to figure out how to assimilate within this group of talent. And, and over the last three games, he's been superb. He was awesome against Arkansas. Uh, I think it's 17 points and 11 assists on the road. I mean, he scored or assisted on the first 14 points of that game. So they're, they're, you can tell, and it's a long way of answering your question, Neil, but they're, yes, they're trying to learn how to play together, but they're, start, they're showing signs of figuring it out now, and they're, becoming, they're certainly becoming more efficient. Maybe you just answered it, and it's uh, it's it's continuity and whatnot. But they haven't lost in a month. Their three losses they have are all to teams inside the top seventy-five and the Ken Palm. Really, two of them in the top thirty-three, all away from Baton Rouge. Is there sort of a common denominator that has struck them in the games they've dropped? Yep, uh, figuring out how to sustain a run when you're on, or, or or sustain a lead when the other team goes on a run when you're on the road, like they. The game, so they lost the Florida State game. That was a game that they just controlled for 37 minutes, and they gagged it away against the veteran tournament team in the final three minutes. Uh, that was down in Orlando for Thanksgiving. The game against Oklahoma State was the next day, and they just didn't get up off the mat after the, the Florida State loss, and they just they, that's by far their worst performance. The game at Houston, Houston was undefeated at the time, and I believe their their net ranking was 12 when LSU went and played there, and or it was or maybe it was 20. It was it was it was high. Um, LSU led by double digits in the second half, and Houston went on a run, and that environment just swallowed them whole. Young team, first true road game, and they just did not respond to Houston's run. Uh, they started turning the ball over. They were inefficient on offense. They couldn't defend. Um, they allowed easy transition buckets. Every, everything that happens. When a team goes on a run and a crowd gets into it, the avalanche fell on LSU's head, and they blew a big lead. Um, it's that that to me is the like it's going to happen tonight. Like it, it will not surprise me at all if LSU has a lead and maybe even a significant lead. You know, it wouldn't surprise me if, if LSU at some point late in the first half, or early in the second half, gets up ten. Like it just it wouldn't. I'm not predicting it, but it wouldn't surprise me if it happens. They have enough talent to go on a spurt where a lead swells. But at some point, Ole Miss is going gonna, is gonna to respond because they're a good team and they're you know, shooting 50% from the floor and they're disciplined on offense and 
I saw like they assist on 57% of their, their, their points, which is insane. But anyway, that's going to happen, and the crowd's going to get into it. And if LSU can actually get a bucket and quiet the crowd and, and mitigate that damage, that's, that'll be the difference. Like There was a sequence against Arkansas the other night, and LSU had gotten up, I guess you got the, LSU had gotten up like 13 in the second half. And Arkansas goes on a run, and on consecutive possessions, LSU, Skylar Mays takes the ball down the floor on one possession and just dribbled out the shot clock and then shot an off-balanced, you know, falling away shot in the key, and it got tipped. And then the next possession down, Tremont Water, same thing, didn't pass just dribbling around the, the perimeter. He tries to drive, and he spins and loses the ball in the lane. Just couldn't get into a half-court set, and it's it's surprising that Will Wade allows that. It's more surprising that it continues to be an issue, but that's that's it. I mean, if, if you want to point to the one thing in their losses and the one thing that's been this team's absolute bugaboo, it's that. It's when the other team goes on a run, the crowd gets into a game, LSU implodes like they have just not handled that well so far it looks like this is the toughest game out of several coming up where you know either way I mean even if you lose there's plenty of room here but LSU has a really friendly early half schedule where Ken Palm's got them not just favored but highly favored in at least about their next five games prior to a road trip to Mississippi State yeah very astute Chase they um so we talked about this a ton really the you know before conference play started the only game they would have been an underdog in would have been the game Saturday at Arkansas because, I mean, nobody had LSU as an underdog at Ole Miss until now. I mean, now we've seen what Ole Miss is. Um, and so we talked so much about this team needs to start 7-1, and 6-2 and two at worst through the first eight games because that middle stretch you talked about where they go to Mississippi State and they're home against Auburn and they're at Kentucky, you're not going to be favored in any of those. So – you need to make your hate now because it's going to get bumpy and then it lightens up again down the stretch where they've got, I think they've got you know, A&M and um, I'm trying to think who else is there. A&M that. and Vanderbilt at home and then road and trips Van- to yeah. Alabama and Florida. Yeah. So, I mean, it, so it, it light, the road trip to Florida is obviously not easy, but it, it lightens up again near the end, but that middle part is rocky. So you've you got to make your hay because you figure for LSU to be a tournament team this year, twelve and six in the league is probably what it's going to tell you. Know, Eleven and seven, you know, puts you right there in the conversation. Twelve and six would would absolutely no doubt solidify your spot in the tournament. But to get there, you had to go seven and one, six and two at worst in these first eight games. Let's kind of switch it over a little bit. What's the uh, what's the mood in Baton Rouge with football? They're coming off the the win over UCF, where there are hardly any uh, defensive backs left on the field there at the end. Um, what's the attrition been like draft wise? Just sorts of what, what's going on with Ed Orgeron's group? Yeah, they, I mean everyone knew they'd lose Greedy Williams and Devin White. Uh, they also lost Ed Alexander early to the draft. He's the nose tackle, uh, but surprisingly light. I mean they got everybody else back and. You know, a year ago, going into the season, you know, going into this past season, the whole story was the fact that they were replacing everybody. I mean, they lost their entire offense and pretty much every major contributor except for Devin White and and Greedy Williams on defense. And this year, it's the complete opposite of that. I mean, everybody's back. I mean, you got to replace Devin White and Greedy Williams. I'm not trying to minimize that, but LSU's recruited well enough to where you know, they've got the next guy in line you know, ready to step in and, and take over. Like Jacob Phillips could be a 100-tackle guy at, at middle linebacker next year. Um, you know, Kristen Fulton could be a first-round pick at cornerback next year, stepping in for Greedy. Um, so people are excited, man. It's, you know, the, the conversation a year ago, and I know we had it, guys, it was LSU had so many question marks, and they were facing what on paper looked like such a tough schedule that – the prognosticators who had that team of seven and five, I think were, and I was one of them, were justified to, to think that of the team. Well, Miami ended up not being very good. Auburn had a really tough year. You know, some of those games that when LSU won them were top ten wins, ended up maybe not being as impressive. But it doesn't negate the fact that you know, uh, facing some really long odds, LSU still went nine and three, won a, won a Fiesta Bowl to get to ten wins, and now you try to carry that momentum where. 
you get everybody back, you're going to supplement this roster with a top five signing class, and then you look at the schedule. Because, I mean, Georgia rotates off, Vanderbilt rotates on, you know, Auburn, A&M, Florida all come to you this year where those were road games last year. I mean, everything – you do have to go to Alabama, and they have a, a – a, 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 <laughs> and they do have to go to Texas as well in, in a non-conference game in Austin. But the aside from that, LSU should be favored in every other game. Like They should be favored in ten games next year, and a lot of people are going to be picking LSU to be – a 10 and 2 11 and 1 type season and i think that's a a justified expectation that can they can they match it can they exceed it we'll see like i still don't think that this team can beat alabama i think winning at texas is going to be a really big ask for them but like could they could they win every other game on their schedule yeah i i, I think so i mean it's just it's going to be a very different conversation in the preseason about lsu this year than people were having last year We'll take a break in our talk with Matt to tell you about Pop Up Oxford. It is coming January 19th. It is lasting through the 27th. You got men's basketball, women's basketball, community reading, songwriter competitions, hotel hop, MLK service day, Monday, movies at the Belfry, the art crawl, the cocktail class and tasting we've been telling you about. That's the bitter and bites on the 22nd. You got tons of things going on with Pop Up Oxford. You can see a full calendar of events. At visitoxfordms.com. Also, popupoxfordms.com to see everything going on with Pop Up Oxford. On Tuesday, January the 29th, Pinnacle Trust will be hosting their annual economic forecast in Jackson, Mississippi at the Country Club of Jackson. Doors open at 5. Join the Pinnacle team for cocktails and appetizers. The program begins at 6 and will end promptly at 7. Goldman Sachs economist John Towsley will be highlighting the current state of global economy and financial markets. The Pinnacle Investment Team will cover topics ranging from geopolitical risk to tariff negotiations and the impact on markets and the Federal Reserve. For those unable to attend, the event will be recorded and made available on the Pinnacle Trust website, pintrust.com. That's P-I-N-N trust.com. For reservations, email assistant at pintrust.com or call the office at 601-957-0323. Uh, Ole Miss returns to the pavilion with their 10-game winning streak tonight as they take on the LSU Tigers. The first 1,000 fans will receive a Nike Terrence Davis commemorative poster. Limited tickets remain, can be purchased by visiting OleMissTicks.com. The Ole Miss baseball season right around the corner. Season tickets start at just $150. To purchase, visit OleMissTicks.com. The Ole Miss women's hoops team is back in action on Sunday afternoon at 3 as they take on the Florida Gators. It's a powder blue out. Tickets can be purchased by visiting OleMissTicks.com. The Ole Miss ten- men's tennis team kicks off their home slate with a doubleheader versus North Alabama beginning at 2 p.m. on Saturday. Admission is free. For more information, visit OleMissSports.com. And then the men's hoops team looks to defend the pavilion with a matchup versus the Arkansas Razorbacks at noon on Saturday. The first 1,000 fans will receive a free Fins Up t-shirt. Limited tickets remain and can be purchased by visiting OleMissTicks.com. Check out Master Cuts Lawn and Landscape, 662-607-7773. They came uh Checked out some landscaping for me yesterday. I know some of you signed up recently. Appreciate that. Time to get those contracts in order for 2019. Let them take care of all of the mowing, edging, weeding, that kind of thing. But also handling landscape, handling flower beds, new pine straw, whatever you need. Again, you can find out by getting a free quote with them at 662-607-7773. Now back to Matt Moscona on the Oxford Exxon Podcast. You mentioned Alabama a couple of times. You've been around this a while. Um, everyone's leaving Saban right now. He's got a lot of players in the transfer portal, and he also has uh, also has a lot of coaches leaving. Is this just a reset for them? No big deal, or is this maybe the first sign that that the 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 era of just total complete dominance is coming to a close? I'm not going to bet against Nick Saban. He loses great players and coaches every year. and it, I know a lot of people have alluded to it, but it feels almost like what happens in the NFL with Belichick's assistants, where some people just want to get a piece of whatever has made that work so well and try to replicate it. I, I feel like that's happening with Saban. But the thing, this is why Nick's so smart. Like He has, 
he has built in protections on his staff by what he's done now. Mom, yeah, we're going to go in Mama's car, but sorry about that, guys. Um, we, he has built in protections on his staff to where he's hiring assistants and analysts that are just going to take over in the inevitability that he loses guys to other to other jobs. So, I mean, that that was the plan, obviously, with Dan Enos, and now you know Enos decided to go down to Miami. But it's what happened with Mike Loxley. It's what happened with Lane Kiffin. It's it's what happened with Sark for a minute. Sarkisian's coming back now, but it's. It's it's smart of Nick. Yeah, we are going to go on Mama's car, buddy. Hey, look, go watch Sesame Street. <laughs> y'all are getting y'all are getting the show this morning. Oh, all good. Um, um, but but yeah. So I, I I think Nick is smart. He's always going to make sure he's three steps ahead of everybody. And then he's still got a talented roster. He signed the number one signing class in the country. And let's not forget, he still gets Tua back next year, and he's going to get all those receivers back, and he's going to get you know. Najee Harris back at running back. I mean, they're just – he's still got Dylan Moses, and he's going to have uh, Patrick Sertain back next year as well. I mean, they're just – Raekwon Davis came back. If if this is the demise of Alabama, then it, it shows just what level they're, they have been at for such a long time. Yeah, I just – I don't – I think I agree with you uh, that we're all just sort of searching for some reason to think that it's coming to a close because it's – there's just an Alabama fatigue that has kicked in, which is not their fault. I give them credit for it. Um, you mentioned playing Texas, and obviously they play Texas A&M. I know Orgeron's not on anything resembling a hot seat or anything like that, but just how big are those games for him in terms of continuing to get the LSU people who may, may be a little skeptical to completely buy in? Well, I, it is well, it is big, and, and here's why. So – it's one thing, you know, like whenever you're projected to win seven and you win nine and people are excited, but they went nine and three last year too. And nine and three is what got Les fired. You know, Les Miles didn't get fired because he couldn't beat Alabama. It was because he started losing to Mississippi State and Hugh Freeze nipped him a couple of times. And, you know, Gus got him. And it's like that, that's, that's what, you know, and Arkansas came into Baton Rouge and you know, won by three touchdowns. Like that's what got less fired. If if Ed now has those expectations, and he loses three games, well now now it's fair to look around and say you're no better off than you were. So it is big. Um, it, it's it's big to beat A and M in your stadium, especially after what happened in the seven overtime game. You know, I'm I'm maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong for this, but I'm going to go ahead and concede the, the loss to Alabama until LSU proves they can beat them. I'm certainly not going to pick them. So if you lose to Bama again, and and then you lose to A&M, and you lose to Texas, well, you're 9-3 and three again, and you're no better than you were, uh, even in the face, or especially in the face of you know, lofty expectations. So yeah, I, mean, I, I do think it's big. It's not just a perception thing. It's, a, it's an on-field result. It's like, the LSU hasn't been in the SC championship game since 2011. I mean, that's that's a that's a long drought for this program, which was used to being there basically every other year for 15 years. So, yeah, it's it's big. I mean, it's big. It's big to to put yourself back in that conversation for the SEC championship and, and possibly the playoff because this is the team for LSU to do it. Like this is the the veteran team where you get a lot of guys back, you get the favorable schedule, and it's fair to say right, if you don't do it this year, then then when? I mean, you have to wait another two years, another three years, wait till this you know, incoming class that's, you know, the number three class in the country till their juniors. I mean, is that your next best shot? So, yeah, they're, they're all big. I mean, you're right in saying it's not a hot seat conversation, but but the expectations never go away at a place like LSU. And I think Ed understands that. But at, at some point, you got to start. You got to start meeting those. Those lofty expectations, and you know, a, a nice season at nine and three, and get to a nice bowl game, just isn't what people crave around here. I want to flip you one more time, Matt. As we kind of get into the class closing, LSU is going to be ranked one or two in pretty much every baseball poll moving toward the uh, the spring. It feels like Deplandis has been on campus like fourteen years in Baton Rouge, but he's back. They've got a lot of guys, yeah. and then. Hess Hilliard and Walker could be really, really good. But what's kind of the, the health of, of Walker? Are they expecting pre-injury self, or what's kind of going on there with the Tigers? Yeah, well, Eric Walker is, for those that, that don't know, Eric Walker was the Sunday guy as a freshman, and he was phenomenal. Um, uh, 
your freshman All America, and then you know, injured his his arm in Omaha and missed all the last year with Tommy John. But he's a hundred percent like full, ready to go. And the, you know the interesting thing too, Chase, you mentioned Mikhail Hilliard. To tell you how loaded this team is, and I'm I'm not big into hyperbole, guys, um, but I've this is the most talented LSU team Paul Maneri's had. Uh, if they're not in Omaha, there something went wrong. They so Mikhail Hilliard was their most consistent arm a year ago. He's not even going to be in the rotation this year. He'll be a bullpen guy. Uh, there's a freshman named Landon Marceau out of Destrehan, Louisiana, who's coming in, turned down a seven-figure signing bonus just because he always dreamed of playing at LSU, and he's going to end up being the Saturday guy. It's like Maneri sometimes early in the season will give the nod to his his veteran guys sort of as a respect thing, but it's going to go Hess, Marceau, Walker. That's going to be your weekend rotation in conference play, and Hilliard's going to be a – a, a mid relief bullpen guy. It's you know maybe a fourth starter if they need it for the midweek. But I think it's gonna be too valuable in conference play to to you know to burn them on the in the midweek. But they are they are loaded, man. They are as as talented a team as I've seen. They will hit for power. They will hit for average. They will hit one through nine. They will defend their middle infield last year of Hal Hughes and Brant Broussard. They're both gonna gonna lose their jobs. Uh, Josh Smith is back from injury and probably Mike Bianco's kid is going to start. Um, they got another kid named Gavin Duga. They got a, 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 a Juco transfer named uh, Saul Garza, who's going to play first while he works on a knee injury. Then he's going to catch and he, he just hits bombs. Are there guys? I mean, I'm this uh, chase. I mean, I, I know you're big into baseball. I know we'll talk plenty about this throughout the season, but this is an LSU team that is, is worthy of every accolade it's gotten. And if they are not in Omaha, Something went terribly wrong for this team because they 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 have every piece to go on a run and go win the national championship. Okay, so I'm gonna need you to do me a favor. At some point this season, if Drew Bianco gets like some game winning hit or something, I'm really gonna need you to come moderate my message board for about 48 hours. If you could uh, if you could promise me that, just just come hang out, just delete some threads. Let let, let let's try. Oh to bring no some no levity. no! There will be no censorship. We're gonna watch. I'm gonna watch that puppy burn. That's gonna actually be that's gonna be high level entertainment. I think Drew Bianco will start the first game of the season at third base. I believe he will be LSU starting third baseman game one. Yes, he they love it, man. He's he has uh, he is he is meshed very well, and and he's going to get a chance to start game one. Ole Miss is in Baton Rouge the uh, the first week of May. They're probably the best two teams in the SEC West. Uh, Ole Miss trying to break that streak. They still have not won a series in Baton Rouge since 1982. Uh, That's crazy. Yeah, dated back. But, yeah, no, you, you, you made a good mention there because there's not a lot of – I was talking to Neil about this yesterday. There's not a lot of draft-eligible arms, but there's so many good freshman, sophomore arms. I mean, Ole Miss, LSU, State, all got guys that turned down seven figures to show up on campus. You've got, you know, the Kumar kid at, at Vanderbilt. And I, one more little thing for Ole Miss and LSU, they both missed Van- Vanderbilt on their schedules this year. Neither one of them going to have to play the Commodores. Yep. That it's the other not, not only Vanderbilt but Florida has to come to Baton Rouge as well. It's it's it, it's odd in that they the roster is great and the schedule did kind of align in LSU's favor. It's um, you mentioned Ole Miss has to come to Baton Rouge. It, it's one of those. I'm telling you, look at the roster, look at the schedule. LSU will be a national seed, and if they obviously they lose a home super regional, that's devastating. This this team should be in Omaha. If they're not, it's it's a major major upset. So, uh, so you're telling me that I should find an LSU message board? Should they like lose in their own regional and and watch that burn too? Oh, if if this team loses in its own, uh, I just there's <laughs> there's just I, I don't I don't like this. Don't say never, guys. man. I, I I watched Tennessee Tech beat Ole Miss twice uh, on, on a Monday last year. <laughs> we've we've all like I mean we've all been burned at some point in our careers for speaking an absolute. So I I and I'll tell you mine was in 2007 when LSU football was ranked number one in the country and lost at Kentucky. I said like zero chance Kentucky wins that game and they beat LSU in three overtimes. So that's like that was my lesson. Don't, don't speak in absolutes. Um, I will just be stunned if this team isn't in Omaha. I'll be stunned. Okay, fair enough. Uh, let me ask you a question because I'm curious. This is going to come up and, and Chase is going to kill me right now. I've I have I have vociferously and consistently defi- uh, fought against those who were critical of of uh, Mike Bianco's kid not 
coming to play for Mike Bianco because I don't think, A, I don't think it's fun for a player to play for his dad, and B, I don't think an employee owes his employer his kids. That being said, if the roles were reversed, because I know this is what some Ole Miss people say, and they're probably right, so I want to get your thoughts on it. If in this scenario, say Paul Maneri had a gifted 18-year-old and he left Baton Rouge to go play at, I don't know, Ole Miss, Mississippi State, Texas A&M, you choose your SEC West rival, how would that have gone over in, in Baton Rouge? Well, um, Les Miles' son is a fullback at Texas A&M right now, so kind of went through that a little bit. If Ben Miles was a really good high school football player at my alma mater at Catholic High in Baton Rouge, I mean, not just – you know, the coach's kid, but like a recruitable D1 athlete. And I recognize not a lot of schools use fullbacks anymore. But, you know, Ben Miles had an offer from LSU to play for his dad, and he chose to go play in Nebraska. And you know, they obviously had a coaching change with Mike Riley getting fired, and then he, Ben left and went to and went to play for Jimbo at, at A&M. And, of course, Jimbo was less his OC for a couple of years in Baton Rouge. And there were a lot of people. The, the thought was that Ben Miles should walk on at LSU. And, and and save the program a scholarship. It'd be, be the fullback here and save the program a scholarship because, you know, let, he's the coach's kid and all that stuff. And, and Les and Kathy Miles did exactly what Mike Bianco did and said, look, I'm not going to tell my kid where to go. Let him do what he feels best for him. And all of their kids went away to school, uh, and they were all D1 athletes. I mean, Les's daughter went and was a, a scholarship swimmer at Texas, his – uh, oldest son is a is a quarterback at North Carolina, and you know, then we just mentioned Ben Miles. So, in, in a sense, we have seen that. Um, I don't know that it's apples to apples. We'll see how good Drew Bianco is at LSU. Um, but um, I, I I don't know, man. You, if you're asking me what fans would do, of course there's going to be a segment of the fan base that that would that would melt. But the other part of it is, as a as a dad. I would want for my kid whatever's best, and I would say, hey, make your decision, go where you feel is best for you, and your mom and I will support you. So I, I know that's not going to sit well with fans, and I do, I do understand the Ole Miss fans that, that, that have questions about that. But realistically, if you think of it more as a, as a parent instead of as a fan, you, I think you'll understand. At least most good parents would. Yeah, I mean, it, it depends on kids. You know, Mike's whole thing always was he just never thought the kid would be able to be a, one of the guys. You know, guys worry about what they say around the coach's kid or whatever. There's just some some sort of exclusion that would potentially happen. I mean, it, it worked out for, you know, I guess Kyle Serrano with Dave, but I can I, I can also point out a lot of instances where it's been a, a, a pretty bad thing also just with – you almost punish your kid because he's your son because you don't want to do the favoritism thing. It's a really, really bad tightrope tight rope to walk. I There's a lot of father-son examples, and I think you said it well, Chase. Some of them work, some of them don't. But ultimately, as a parent, you, look, and sometimes the kid wants to play for their dad. Some, like Sometimes they've grown up only playing for their dad or being around their dad in a program, and that's what they've always wanted to do. And, and you respect that. I mean, um, uh, Tony Robichaud at ULL, his his kid ended up being a high round draft pick. Oh yeah, was a a, a weekend ace who, pro- who probably could have gone to pitch anywhere, but he wanted to pitch for his dad, so he went to he went to ULL. I mean, it it happens. I mean, it happens both ways. And I, I mean, again, I as, as I understand why fans would would want the coach's kid to go help the coach's program, but I think most people as parents would recognize you, you just want what's best for your kid, and you let them make that decision. Well, safe uh, travels today, Matt. Really appreciate it there on a short notice. And let's uh, let's do it again soon. You got it, guys. Anytime. Thanks. Thanks to Matt. I know he had a busy day today, so appreciate him giving us some uh, some time this morning. The podcast is also brought to you by Scripted Jewelry. Go check the website out. If you haven't done it, if you haven't listened to me to this point, do it today. ScriptedJewelry.com. You'll see all the different ways they handcraft to order. They get the turnaround times quickly and to you. Great gift ideas from Valentine's Day to birthdays or just that special thing for that special someone. You can see all the ways to put your script on a piece of jewelry with scripted jewelry. So uh, Frequency has questions, lookbooks, even tells you what some recent customers have ordered on the website. And when you go to check out Rebels10, R-E-B-E-L-S-1-0 for 10% off with scriptedjewelry.com. 
podcast also brought to you by the Weston Jackson. Restore serenity to your soul. Visit Soul Spots, the ultimate luxury spa experience in downtown Jackson. You can indulge in personalized massages, signature facials, soothing body treatments, and much more on their extensive spa list. Escape from the everyday. Rejuvenate yourself in their luxury spa today. Then gather at Estelle Wine Bar and Bistro. Sip on a creative craft cocktail or enjoy their curated wine list. It's open for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and Sunday brunch. Chef Caden's mission is to connect guests with the community through local partnerships. So gather at Estelle tonight. The podcast also brought to you in part by John Edwards of Regency Travel Incorporated in Memphis. We've been talking about this for a little while and a lot of you have taken advantage of it. Really appreciate that. For those of you that haven't, here's how it works. You call John. You tell John what you're looking to do. Uh, whether it's an anniversary trip, it's a big summer trip, a uh, family trip, a golf trip to uh, Scotland, Ireland, whatever it may be, get in touch with John, give him some parameters, when you want to go, kind of what you're looking to do, where do you want to go, your budget, and he'll give you options that you would not be able to find on your own because he's part of Virtuoso, which is a worldwide network of travel partners that allows John to supply his clients with added values and unique benefits that are simply not available to other travelers. He's been traveling for 37 years. No one knows uh, global travel uh, the way that he does. So get in touch with him. Take advantage of that expertise. 901-494-3387 or send him an email at jedwards at regencytravel.net. First-time clients can save $50 off their first booked trip just by telling John you heard about Regency Travel on the podcast. It's a podcast that's also sponsored by Grenada Nissan. If you're in the market for a Nissan vehicle, Grenada Nissan's the place to go. They have a complete selection of new and previously owned Nissan vehicles, great lease deals as well. Get in touch with Gene and Sandy. Let them know what you're looking for. If they don't have it, they'll get it. Uh, their service after the sale is just absolutely fantastic. They're great people. They've been with us for a long time. If you're in the market for a Nissan vehicle, you owe it to yourself to check them out. Grenada Nissan USA. Dot com. So a lot there with uh with Matt. Should be an entertaining game tonight. Some football stuff, uh, some baseball stuff as uh as well as I kind of thought of as we were finishing up that uh that interview with the SEC baseball. It's just kind of a mad lib. But it's the same thing every year. You uh move maybe move some teams around, but the uh the SEC West may be as competitive as uh as can be. Um, kind of piggybacking off what we talked about yesterday a little bit is uh, Kyler Murray has a, has a entered the NFL draft. Now that just from a yesterday's standpoint, that's just paperwork. Um, there's no final decision yet. But um, this CBA thing, the way that some of these teams have changed thought. I mean, he, Matt talks about that LSU is getting a seven figure guy to campus. Gunnar Hoglin, obviously on Ole Miss's campus. JT Ginn on Mississippi State's campus. Carter Stewart was a guy that what was uh, not signed last year. Where's he now? The uh, Braves won that. Hearing. He went. He went to JUCO. I don't know. He's at some junior college. Um, Braves got their pick back. I'm pretty sure he's at junior college. Point being, um, it's kind of changed things. I mean, you're about to unless there's another switch somewhere, you're going to see more and more high level arms that decide to go the college route. It seems like. Yeah, the uh, Kyler Murray thing's fascinating. I was listening to an interview last night with uh, Susan Schussler. Yeah, covers, Slusser. Yeah. S-L-U-S-S-E-R. Slusser, yeah. She covers the uh, A's. She was voted the uh, California Sports Writer of the Year yesterday. She's, she's incredible. She's, she's really made, good. A, a incredible writer. Great reporter. Um, and she was talking about she found it fascinating that when the A's went to visit Murray the other day and – it was sort of like you said, it was misreported that the A's were on a deadline. That Kyler Murray can go through the draft. It doesn't really affect his A's contract. But they're talking about giving him a major league contract. And part of the, the uh, crew that went to visit with him was Major League Baseball's marketing people. Which, hopefully, they're a little younger and a little more hip than some of the sports writers who were worked up about Clemson and McDonald's yesterday. Um, but Major League Baseball starting to – it was fascinating. They're starting to acknowledge that they have an identity problem with young people. And they absolutely do. I live in a house with a 12-year-old boy who is in the vast minority – uh, who is into Major League Baseball and can talk about Major League Baseball players. His 
his friends, they know the NBA. They know the NFL. They know European soccer stars. And they know a lot of college players, obviously, because they live in a college town. They don't know many MLB players. The funny thing about this, though, is you're exactly right. But if I'm Billy Bean, that's not my individual problem for me to try to fix by handing a guy a contract that makes no sense. But they can put him on their 40 man and protect him for four years. So they could that, uh, and that would allow them to give him whatever they need to give him financially to make it work. And if you're Billy Bean, you do want it, would be nice to have a marketable player. Now, he's going to get a target on his back right away. Yeah, what if he's not good enough? I mean, that's the thing in this. He's a project. But he wouldn't extent. be the first person on a 40-man roster who never no, no, was no, good no, 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 no. I guess my point is it also sets a really strange precedent. What well, does that? Because it's not just the the football thing. It could be any first-round pick that goes, hey, look, sure. four now, but, hey, 15 tomorrow. And if you have the leverage, most guys don't have the leverage. Most kids picked Carter Stewart last year didn't have the leverage. To yeah, he do tried. That. Yeah, you know, Gunnar Hogland wouldn't have had that kind of leverage. Hey, no, no, you no. want me? You got to put me on your major league roster. They'd have been like, "Hey, kid, you're Casey mean. Myers might have, could have." And that day's coming. Stuff changes. The way people negotiate changes. I've heard people criticizing, you know, Kyler Murray for, "Hey, you signed a deal." He did, and if he bolts on the A's, he'll have to give the money back. But he's evaluating his options. Here's what's fascinating, and Susan Slusser said this last night. She had talked to a lot of NFL people. And when she says she talked to a lot of NFL people, I suspect that she talked. Her husband covers the NFL. I too. suspect that she talked to several NFL front office people. And she said his grade right now, and look, grades are just getting started, but his grade right now, among NFL teams, ranges from potentially the first pick in the draft to the third round. Some organizations value him highly. Some don't. And now it just takes one. It only, oh, it only takes one. I'm, you know me. I'm a capitalist. I have always been a capitalist. I will always be a capitalist. I am for Kyler Murray, two things. Do what you want to do. And get as much as you can. Especially as an athlete. Because your window closes as an athlete. Father Tom's going to get you, unless your name's Drew Brees or Tom Brady. Otherwise, he gets you. And he'll get them eventually. Drew Brees will not make it 50 what he's making at 40. So you have a window. Get all you can. But Murray's so volatile because of that fact that some people think he's a, a a star NFL quarterback and some people simply believe he's just too undersized. And when I say some people, I mean NFL people who are paid to make these evaluations. NFL people don't like going against the norm. They don't like being that, that one out on the thing and goes, oh, I know he's only 5'8", but hey, I'll wear it. Well, because if it doesn't work out, that's the end of your career. You don't live it down. You're known as that guy that took that gamble. You're the guy. Unless you can somehow blame ownership. Because sometimes ownership says this is who we're taking. Oh, yeah, yeah, And yeah. then you're, okay, well, got to get that out. It's happening in Chicago right now with the Cubs. Where do you think these leaks are coming from? Coming from the front office. It's all about the ownership. Real quick, Matt mentioned this earlier uh, from a betting standpoint. Uh, Ole Miss opened as a five-point favorite. It's now at four and a half. That's fallen half a point to this uh, to this point. When I saw the line last night, my initial inclination was give me LSU in the points. On well, a game where you feel a coin flip, I'll take five points. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's – Exactly. I, I don't – but, you know, Ole Miss is what, 13-1 and one against the line this they year? They are. 14-1 now. 14-1. and one. Yeah. Um. Their only non-cover is Cincinnati. Yeah. And that was that was a while ago. Football. LSU hasn't lost in a month. Football was still going on. Yeah. 
LSU did not look great at Arkansas. No, and they've got some wins that are kind of close and ugly um, on their schedule. They're they a, didn't. They didn't look great at home against Alabama. They're a volatile team. You could get anything with them. They they're, could get really rattled, and Ole Miss could run them out of the building in the last five minutes, or it could be down to the wire. Here's what Ole Miss has tonight: better coach. Kermit Davis is better basketball coach than Will Wade. A more experienced team. Home court. What does LSU have? Probably more overall talent. Playing on the road in the SEC. And this place will be, I can't believe I'm saying this, this place will be so much more hostile than Bud Walton was the other day. Oh, no, tonight's going to be pretty wild, I think. It has a chance to be a pretty live environment tonight. Yeah, Bud Walton was sort of tame the other night really? on television. Well, they're just sort of, they make the tournament some, but they're just kind of meh. Yeah, they're going to. I think they're going to make a move. There's just not much there. He's kind of coaching wise. for his gig right now, and it's not not yeah. looking up at the moment. No, and they've got the money up there to go get a much better coach than Mike Anderson. I think they might hire whoever they'd like to to hire to a degree if they felt the need or the desire. Well, I think up there, I'm guessing I don't know enough about Arkansas dynamics. To know, but I'm guessing up there that with football in the absolute toilet, that getting basketball going would be a good thing. I'm sure Dave Van Horn would appreciate basketball getting going a little bit. Kind of take the focus off him a little bit in February, as I'm sure Mike Bianco is greatly appreciative of Kermit Davis. Going out on that limb. Mike's thinking, yeah, I wouldn't mind a run in March. Pick us up a little while later. Give us a little time to kind of get it together. Build a little chemistry before everybody's hanging on pitch selection in the fourth inning of a midweek game. It's a good problem that has its negatives with the Ole Miss uh, baseball situation. It is. A lot of baseball programs get to kind of just operate in obscurity and figure it out over the course of 35, 40 games. He's potentially going to have a really different kind of coverage year. If you think about it, there's going to be a lot of focus on spring football, depending on how much availability there is. And a lot of basketball. And there's a chance this basketball team's playing into a different time of March than we're used to. Might not be the 10 media circus on a Tuesday against Arkansas State. Might even be a deal on a Tuesday against Arkansas State where some people are running press releases and the fans don't even notice. Yeah. We'll obviously have a reaction tomorrow. We'll have Jeffrey on Thursday and uh, plenty more the rest of the week on the podcast. What is our plan for Thursday? To, uh, uh, actually, I don't think we're having a show Thursday, are we? Uh, you're, you're, you're going out of town. I will be traveling that morning. I will talk to Jeffrey and let's just table it for now. We'll do that. We'll just table the – I mean, talk to him off air, and then we will table the conversation gotcha. for a Thursday show. We can uh, we can do that. But. This podcast has been brought to you by Harry Alexander. Harry's an Oxford-based REMAX legacy realty agent. Harry's been in Oxford more than four decades. No one knows the residential and condo market in Oxford better than Harry. Go to his site. I'll prove it to you, harryalexander.com. Send him an email at ha at harryalexander.com. It's also been brought to you by Oxford University Bank, OUB locally owned and operated right here in Oxford. When you deposit money at OUB, that money and the vast majority of the bank's profits go right back into the Oxford community. OUB gives you the comfort of home, all the benefits the big mega banks provide, all the technology and products you can want, all with a personal touch. OUB also has a uh, commercial checking account now paying 1% interest as long as you keep $10,000 in the account. comes with fully interactive online banking. You don't have to go uh, to the bank to deposit checks anymore. Um, and also, more than likely, any business owner at another bank is now paying a monthly fee for their account, and they're most assuredly not making 1% on that money. So uh, to learn more, go to uh, liveoxfordbankoxford.com or call 662-234-6668. Oxford University Bank is FDIC insured. We'll probably have some bourbon conversation with Matt Moscona next time we uh, speak to him. He was on a bit of a crunch, so I uh, didn't do that today. I see some people on Twitter asking that, but... Uh, We'll get to that in due time. Plenty of time to talk to Matt, as I think uh, we both cover pretty good uh, baseball programs that will be in the thick of it for most of uh, the spring. So we'll talk to you tomorrow here on the podcast.